Can you hear me now? We can hear you. Yes. Okay. Uh, I uh, had the thought over the last couple of months when thinking about programs about uh, getting a couple of clergymen from West LA, Westwood, to talk about uh, the issue that many of, the, of our churches are having of getting people back into our churches as the pandemic is kind of beginning to ease off. Now, I, I go to St. Paul the Apostle. It's a wonderful parish with a wonderful pastor and where our attendance is way down, but there are ways maybe that the pastor can discuss how we can change that. So I thought I'd get, a, as I said, a couple of clergymen. And the first one I thought of was someone from the Sinai Temple in Westwood. The Sinai Temple is on the corner of Beverly Glen and Wilshire. And I believe, Rabbi, you said it's it's open for uh, people can go in it and, and uh, get tours of it, I believe. But anyway, I was there. Yeah, I was there many years ago because I have a very good friend of mine, Abner Goldstein, who's in that temple. And he got an award there and I went and went to the award. Anyway, Rabbi uh, Aris Sherman has served at the Sinai Temple since 2014. He's from Syracuse, New York, another New York, upstate New Yorker like my wife was from Rome, New York. Wow. We figured the weather's too cold and too much snow back there, so get out to the West Coast. Uh, his, uh, his father was a rabbi there, and it's kind of a family business. His sister is a rabbi in New Jersey, and his wife is a rabbi at the Sinai Temple also. Rabbi Sherman majored in music and Jewish studies at Columbia University in New York. He is a, has a strong, he's a strong advocate of U.S.-Israel is, relations. He has a passion for sports, which is interesting, where he founded, get this now, the Sinai Temple Basketball Camp, and he hosts the weekly podcast, Rabbi on the Sidelines, where he interviews significant figures in, sport, in sports about faith. That's really terrific, Rabbi. Thank you. And uh, our pastor at St. Paul's is Father Gilbert Martinez. Uh, prior to St. Paul's, he served as a pastor of the Paulist Fathers. He's a Paulist priest. That's the community of St. Paul. Father Gilbert Martinez, CSP, community of St. Paul's. Prior to St. Paul's in Westwood, he was a pastor of the Paulist Mother Church in New York City, Manhattan. He first got involved with the Paulist, made his first promises in 1989. He was ordained a priest in May of 1995. He served as a pastor at St. Sebastian's Church in Los Angeles and St. Cyril's of Alexandria Church in Tucson. And prior to that, he was also director of campus ministries, which is something the Paulist Fathers do at a number of colleges in the country, campus ministries at Cal Berkeley. He's a native of El Paso, Texas, but he grew up and was reared in California. He has a Bachelor of Science degree in conservation of natural resources from University of California at Berkeley. And get this, he worked for seven years as a National Park Service Ranger at Grand Canyon at Big Bend National Parks before joining the Paulus Novitiate. What a great background for a priest, huh? Anyway, you guys, uh, Get started and go to it. We're going to talk about uh, how clergy in Westwood are going about getting their congregations back as the pandemic seems to be easing off. Okay, you guys are on. Thank you for coming. Thank you, John. Hi, hi Father. How are you? Hey, how you doing? Good to see you. I'm good. Um, I'm happy to start sharing actually how I met Father Gill because I think that's a pretty neat story that doesn't happen every day. Um, mm -hmm. We're physically neighbors. We can walk to each other's synagogue and church, uh, but we never had um, until the pandemic. And this is actually an amazing story that, uh, as John, you said, how do we go into our synagogue and churches? And now actually more of my people want to go to the church than the synagogue. And I'll explain that in a second why. <laughs> um, and that's actually because over our high holy days this past September, it was like Labor Day weekend and obviously different COVID protocols and um, we basically had a COVID outbreak um, during our service or pre right before our services. 
And even though we were going to allow everybody to come in, we unfortunately had to limit attendance to basically 18 and over. And it upset a lot of members of our community, rightfully so, including my own. My children couldn't go with us to the synagogue. Um, and so we knew for Yom Kippur, our day of atonement, the most holy day of the year, we had to do something um, to make sure that we could worship in a meaningful way. Um, so I actually reached out to a friend of mine, uh, Father Ed Benioff from Church of the Good Shepherd in Beverly Hills, who I actually met, unfortunately, through the tragic shooting at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, when he reached out to us, and then we become, he calls us covenant partners, which I love that term. Um, and he said, why don't you call Father Gill? And I love this story. I shared it with our community. It's a bit humorous, but I think real. Um, I didn't, I, on the website of um, St. Paul's, I couldn't really find any emails of the father or the priest to write to. So I clicked confession and I went right to Father Gill and Father Gill said, meet me basically at the confession after your services. Um, you don't usually hear that on Rosh Hashanah. <laughs> and just the gratitude that we had to Father Gill, my wife, Rabbi Nicole Guzik, we walked over after our services half a mile away and you basically, Father, offered your outdoor space, um, which was amazing. Um, we actually ended up using the church next door in the baseball field, but we had to make sure that the parking that St. Paul's used for their teachers was adjusted. So it was an amazing interfaith partnership. And our community, for the first time, saw outside our walls, right? You go into your walls, and what Rabbi Wolpe, my senior rabbi, often says is, what we do inside our sanctuary should be felt outside in the world. And this was a moment that I thought was a beautiful, beautiful thing, not just for my community, but just weeks later, I was invited by Father Gill to uh, uh, be on a panel with, I forgot the sister's name, and also a movie producer that spoke about the, the Pope and his role um, in Catholicism in the modern world. Um, and I think this is literally just hitting on an, uh, the tip of an iceberg of different faith communities, both respecting their own theologies and practice while also realizing that if we're not for, as Rabbi Hillel says in our uh, tradition, if not for me, who am I for? And if not now, when? I Meaning we have to be for each other. And I love, I mean, first of all, I'm having a lot of fun here. I think I might need to come back. Um, but uh, the fact that we are neighbors and can do these things together. And one other thing that we're doing actually with the Catholic Church, um, actually with Church of the Good Shepherd at their school, we're gonna be hosting our carnival for our holiday of Purim coming up. Um, on their outdoor space. Um, I actually took it, Father Gill, from your model that I saw at a festival a couple of months ago. Yeah, right, um, right. So we are, I think, trading the best of ideas. And um, I'll leave it at this in terms of the question was, how do people come into our doors? And honestly, I'm finding that personal invitation is the best way, um, right? With Zoom and YouTube and TV and anything at the click of a button, I know there are plenty of people that watch our services in pajamas right now, but I can tell you the people that walk in our doors and fear the, and feel the spiritual connection with sacred relationship, um, they're telling their friends. And it's a sports analogy because I'm a sports type of person. When we, a couple of years before the pandemic, we our synagogue debated streaming. And they I was very pro-streaming and they said, Rabbi, but what's the crying need? And when the pandemic hit, they said, well, why don't we do it? I said, well, we had the crying need and now, now we have it. And people said no, because they said, well, nobody will come. And somebody said, you know what? When the Dodgers went on TV, more people came to the game because they saw that what they were missing. And I think if we use technology in the correct uh, positive way, uh, people will tune in and say, oh, I, I can't miss that experience. I wanna see it, I wanna hear it, I wanna feel it. Um, so that's where we are going into the next phase of whatever this will be. And I think it's an exciting time for religious faiths and also religious faiths to come together in a very distinct way. So I'll uh, pass it over to my colleague and friend, Father Gil. <laughs> Thank you, Rev. It's good to see you. Uh, you yeah, I, I, uh, I'm so glad that we were, that we met and I, I really look forward to, to doing more things together, uh, bringing our communities together. Um, uh, I was, I, there's a couple of things you said and I, I because this is, this is the thing we struggle with. Uh, I had, we had the same sort of response. Once we had, we had like, on the weekend, we'd have like between 1,200 and 1,300 people in our church. Uh, and then, you know, as we suddenly closed and, and that was it. They were, the next day we were trying to figure out how to live stream and all that sort of thing. 
Uh, thankfully, through our school, we had a lot of uh, technology, technology already set, so we were able to do it. Uh, but as we've gone through this and, you know, outdoor services, and then we moved back in and, and then Omicron came back. Uh, but we've been struggling with that is, is what's the correct use of, of, uh, of uh, a live streaming for, for church. Uh, so what we have been doing is uh, we, instead of live streaming all of our services, and there's one every day, there's two every day. And then on, on Sunday, there's one to uh, four. So we only, we only do one a week, our, 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 our main service. That's all we do. Uh, Cause we, we want to encourage people to come back and we, you invite them. I, you know, we, we call and check in, but uh, one of the things that's I think probably different in our community is that uh, the Catholics have an obligation to be at mass every Sunday. <laughs> so they're supposed to be here. And I think a lot of the response from the kind of the larger church has been, well, we'll just re they, they lifted that obligation when they, when they, during the height of the pandemic, and then they reinstituted it trying to get people to come back, but that has not worked at all uh, or, or, a very, very small way, very, very small way. But there's, but there's a couple of things that, you know, I talking to people, because I call them and I call people and see how they're doing to check in, especially, you know, with those we know who are sick or struggling and, uh, or people who will come to mass, have, have come to mass and returned, but said, you know, my, my wife is, or my, my uncle or my, my parents, or I have someone who's immunocompromised. And so I, I can't, I can't be here. I just have to stay home. Uh, and then there, then there's a, quite a few number of our school families, particularly they say, "Oh, we love mass online because we can just sit in our pajamas and <laughs> hear, sit in our pajamas and watch it, you know." And we've done our obligation, and and the kids like it. Then we have the whole day to ourselves. So, uh, so I think we're so it's maybe some habits developed in there that would that uh, that make just make it easier. Uh, it, it it has presented a lot of questions to us because we're our church is so. Uh, uh, has so many obligations that people have to, to, to are supposed to, to, to do. But even before the pandemic, we were seeing a, a bit of a decline. And um, but now, at the, coming out of the pandemic, and we still we still have about only about 500 people on the weekend. But it's been slowly inching up, inching up. Uh, but, but you know what? Uh, we as particularly in two areas. One, we have like uh, uh, usually we receive like one or two people in the Catholic Church every year at our Easter vigil services. This year we have eight. They're all young adults, and they're all excited. They re they're really in intent. Uh, they they're looking for meaning, and and so so we're engaging those questions, um, and we're trying to create other pos other opportunities for people to come uh, to, to partly create that personal invitation. I do it on the phone or talk to people, but but the other way is we we have speakers and try to try to get them. We had that movie where you where you were on the panel of Francesco, and it was a great turnout and. But just you know, we work in the crowds and <laughs> asking them to you know come back, please come back. And uh, so, but that personal invitation is, is extremely extremely important. Um, you know, before the pandemic, also I just I just want to note that in addition to the obligation, you know, there's, there were a lot of studies about uh, about the Catholic Church and you know, why do why do people come to the church? <laughs> so that, to, to to meet the sacred, that's that's really the main thing. But but because there's like a church on every corner, they. <laughs> they can choose. And so, so they were always looking, there were three things they were looking for. They're looking for good preaching, they're looking for good music, and they're looking for a sense of community. So, um, so as we kind of open up again, we're really trying to focus, presuming our preaching is okay or good enough, you know, <laughs> I hope it is. And then, and then, you know, our music is very good. We're, so we're very blessed in that way. Uh, but, but how do we kind of double down on community to really make the, that personal invitation uh, and and honor people who, you know, not me. I, I guess one of the things that kind of the pastoral concern I always had was, you know, a, to, to announce that the bishops say it's ob ob you're obligated to come to mass on Sunday. That obligation has been restored, reinstated. But but people are are you know for very good reasons are, have reason they shouldn't come, and um, and to honor that with to invite them without making them feel guilty. You know, put a put a little bit of Catholic guilt in there. You know, just to but just to allow them to uh, uh, to make that to to support where they are and, and and just keep that invitation open. So it's all about being in person, I think. Yeah, and I actually want to say uh, I think a new term I guess is creative ritual. Um, yeah. We have no outdoor space, so that's how I ended up meeting Father Gill because I knew they had outdoor space, and we're looking forward to when somebody needs indoor space when it rains and everything's safe that they'll use ours. Um, but the um, like 
so I'll give you one example that's happened last Friday, right? The, I think what you said, the need to gather is just like so crucial. So we usually are at Home Depot Park once a month for our little kids Sabbath service on Fridays. I bring a keyboard, we play, we have ice cream, popsicles. And there's usually like 10 families. This is pre-pandemic. We did it for the first time uh, this past Friday. There were over 500 people that showed up at Home Depot Park um, wow. and we were overwhelmed. Um, and they said, can we do that next week? I said like, please let's, you know, um, so creative ritual. So that um, for what we started with in the beginning of the pandemic, we thought, oh, this will last three weeks. Like everybody thought, and we'll be back in business. One of our big things is bar and bat mitzvahs for 13 year old boys and girls. And we postponed them. And then we realized that we couldn't postpone them. We had to have them, but how could we have them when we couldn't be inside? And so we basically had like a locker room of rituals items and we were doing we called them zoom mitzvahs and they would be at their home and the clergy would be in the sanctuary and every week we would basically deliver our ark our sacred ark our sacred scrolls to the family and it was beautiful because they made their homes a sanctuary and for the first time we were actually seeing into people's homes and mm -hmm. seeing how they could make their own home a sanctuary as well obviously everybody finally wanted to get back and we are getting back um, but I think creative ritual, and by creative, I don't mean dumbing down tradition, but actually taking very serious tradition and putting it into the world that we live in. The last thing for us, you talked about the obligation. Um, we need 10 Jewish adults to have a service, right? So over the age of 13. And there was a very big uh, discussion within the rabbinic world of if you're 10 people on the screen, does it actually count as a physical presence to have a service? Um, so yeah. for me, and that's also when you say the words of the mourners Kaddish for somebody who's lost a loved one, um, that's when people are often coming and you need that. We decided in that moment that you could on zoom because there was no other option, but then there was this little gray area and we're back to now, for instance, if you come into our daily service, like our daily mass at seven 30 in the morning, if we don't have 10 people, we still don't count the people online to say those prayers. They're more like uh, uh, I don't want to say participants, I want to say observers, right? Yeah. Um, and we see the YouTube count. So if it says 14 online, there's only three in there. We actually don't do those parts because we, we realize that people can actually come in now. So that was like this pendulum shift back and forth. Yeah. And it showed when we weren't doing the prayers when we needed a quorum of people, it actually encouraged people to say, you know what? No, I, I need that. I need to come back. So uh, how ritual played out with technology is like really fascinating. And I don't think we're going to, we can never retract to what we were before pandemic. I think the question is going to be, how do we integrate into what we will be tomorrow? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and yeah, we, we did, we had, um, all of our services, like our baptisms of our funerals or confirmations, they were all outside. We're blessed. We have, our school has this beautiful garden. So it was, it was, a, it was a great place to gather and, and, to, and to do that. But we had to cut out a lot of things because, because of safe, for, for safety. Even now, uh, uh, people, when they receive communion, don't receive the cup. And so and, and, and I think people are really thirsty for that. You know, they, there's a real, I, we, we, uh, we actually uh, give first communion in second grade, if they're eighth grade, they're, the, they're like eight years old. And all the kids are wondering how, you know, will, 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 be, will we be able to receive the cup? <laughs> So we're trying to figure figure that out, and th there's all kinds of guidance from different archdioceses and, and, and Rome and, you know, on those things. So we're, we're trying to go through all that. But uh, yeah, so I, I think um, I, I think the other thing that was, uh, I mean, uh, ritually, uh, one of the things that was I, th I found the most difficult, and, and and we still struggle with that a little bit, is uh, you know we were at the hospital a lot, or people were dying, and mm -hmm. we, we were up, we were on, on Zoom or or, or on Facebook uh, live to. To, to try to do these services. You can't, you can't, you weren't, we weren't allowed to touch them. And mm -hmm. uh, sometimes, and some doctors would let us go in, but it was, then you're, you know, they're kind of trying to figure out if that works out okay. Or people on the phone and you're praying on the phone. And, and it, it was, it was, it was pretty dramatic. And, and now uh, it's, it's amazing. All those, all those calls, people, you know, they used to call the last rites, but I think people really uh, kind of embrace more that the kind of the sense of, of, of Kind of spiritual healing that comes from touch and presence, uh, and not just waiting until they die, you know, but that there's this, this prayer and support of the community and uh, and being anointed, uh, you know, in, in God's spirit to, to for healing. So, 
So yeah, yeah. It's, it's been uh, it's been difficult, but and, and calling for creativity that um, I'm just not sure how, how we're going forward uh, with the integration of technologies. That's I guess that's our big question. We talk about that yeah. a lot. I think the end of life issue is really important. Um, I can just recount a story. This. I'll never forget for the rest of my life. We did a bat mitzvah. It was outdoors. It was pre-vaccination. And uh, we only had a maximum of 25 people. But three weeks later, the father of the bat mitzvah contracted COVID and two weeks later passed away. And I see this young woman now who's 14. Uh, every Sunday, she actually is a teacher's assistant in our religious school. And I realized how even there was a tragic situation five weeks after her rite of passage, how the community is literally keeping her and her family afloat. Um, we gathered for a memorial. Um, we usually do seven days at somebody's house called Shiva. Um, and now when we do these Shiva services, um, sometimes they're in person, sometimes they're online. I actually joke with uh, my other clergy that we have these prayer books like in a suitcase that we carry. I said, definitely easier to carry a link than a suitcase when we do online. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but there's no substitute than having that uh, that personal touch. So those moments I'll, I guess, uh, never forget for the rest of my life. At the same time, I'll also never forget the first high holidays, 2020, when we thought that was hard. There was actually five people in the room. We hired a gigantic production cast or production crew, and we blew it out of the water. That was hard because people said, you know, you're gonna are you gonna keep that up? Um, <laughs> I, I really think. Also spreading, you know, the word of the scriptures, the word of the Bible um, through social media, through media. It's been amazing. Before I go to synagogue, I get to watch my friends around the country. I get to hear a melody in my head and I sing. My wife said, oh, how do you learn that melody? Oh, I heard it in New York 10 minutes ago. <laughs> now it's here. So that part's really neat. Um, even sharing words of, you know, inspiration. Quickly, I can say, you know, Father Gill at St. Paul talked about this in the Exodus and all of a sudden, I was like sitting in your church and I'm talking about that at synagogue. So right. peering, peeking into our colleagues and other communities of faith, I think has been fascinating. And even if you recall just a couple of weeks ago in Texas, in Colleyville, Texas, um, where the rabbi and four members of his congregation were held hostage for 11 hours. Um, that was a live stream service. And if it wasn't for the live stream service, it might've not ended the way it did. For two hours, the public watch what was happening was able to call for help um so i know it's a strange like blessing but thank god that that was live streamed and the world could see what was going on and it ended up safer than we thought yeah yeah but you know that that very night we we had a program here um, violins for hope yeah yeah and um so just as as the uh the young musician was just about to play she 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 was watching the live stream and she said, "Oh, it's it's over. They they've been released." And and so she she mm. she uh, she played the, the last pieces of prayer. It was, it was oh quite beautiful. Gosh. But none of that would have happened without the kind of you know, that technology just right at, the, at our fingertips. So, wow, so nice. Um, John, did we want to open up the questions and conversation? Oh, sorry, I think you're muted. Muted. Please, anyone uh, in our group, please. We can't hear you, John. Jewish tradition with other traditions. John, you have to get closer to your microphone. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, please. Uh, please, I'm going to open this up with questions now or comments from anybody. We have members of our Rotary from St. Paul's, and I'm sure we have some... Uh, Jewish members who go to the Sinai temple. So please uh, let's hear some comments and questions to either of our, our uh, speakers here. I'd like to make a comment and ask a question, but uh, Rabbi and Father Gill, I said, when I started studying the Bible seriously in the 1990s, I realized how important it was and how obvious it is that the God brought ethical monotheism through the Jewish people to the world. And with that connection, it's so wonderful to see a rabbi and a Catholic priest sit here and talk about something that, you know, no matter which faith you're in, it's, it's just it's so enriching that we can get along. In fact, I think there's a closer community between the 
Christians and the Jewish people than there is between the political parties, to be honest with you, <laughs> no question. And that is very gratifying to me. So I was, um, we had our outdoor services outside for all during this last year of the pandemic and people were just biting to get back inside the church. They were just couldn't wait. And with that, it seems that of course there's fewer people, but isn't that a key element to get inside a facility, inside a church or a temple? And doesn't that improve the uh, opportunities to expand during this pandemic? To go inside personally. I just want to ask Father Gill of this because of the outside question. So often when I ask a teenager, where have you had your most powerful prayer experience? They rarely say in the sanctuary because they spent lots of time in Sunday school, but they actually often say at the Grand Canyon or mm-hmm. seeing God's sunset and seeing God's creations. Um, and you, when you have that experience, which I went to the Grand Canyon for the first time this summer with my children, um, I totally get it. Um, so I actually think it's that sort of blend, right? In the, at least in the Jewish tradition in the 1960s, uh, in America, these large synagogues were built in suburban and urban areas. And now often those sanctuaries are just sitting empty and in parks and, you know, outdoors, people are having these spiritual moments. So I think it's a bit of a blend, a blend of both. Um, and I would love to ask Father Gill, actually, based on your previous career, how you maybe yeah. sometimes blend the, na- the nature aspect of God and then what happens in the yeah. building. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's really good. That's a really good point. Uh, you know, we did confirmations outside, which are normally done inside, but, but the students that did it, we confirmed like 70 kids and, you know, high school kids that they were, they were just, they loved it outside. And there's, there's a garden, there's flowers. It was so beautiful. And, they, and, and, and more than a few of them said to me, this, God, this is, this is way better than being inside. <laughs> at the same time, people are chomping at the bit to get outside. Um, but, but which led, I mean, one of the reflections from that was just my, from my own personal experience and have worked at the Grand Canyon at, I looked at the bottom there for two years and, and then up on top for four years. And, uh, but you know, one of the things I, I used to help, I never used to go to church and, uh, or any of that. I, I'd pray all, almost, I think every day I, I offer prayers. And, uh, but, uh, but uh, I had to describe it when I was thinking about seminary. And I just thought that, you know, the, 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 um, the beauty of, of, of the Grand Canyon, the beauty of nature was, was my church. So I, and that's how I, I, I connected with God. So, um, Part of getting trying to get our, our young people back is I, I, I took our eighth graders to Yosemite National Park for a week long retreat the, the week after after Thanksgiving. We took it was kind of it was it, there was some science education to it for sure and, and, and natural education, glaciation, fire behavior, blah blah, blah all that stuff. But but it really was a, a time for them to kind of kind of encounter the the the, the mystery, to encounter encounter God in a different way that they're not really used to and and. Uh, I, I think uh, so. I, so sacred space it, it, for like a lot of Catholics or, or, or people of all faiths, the, the space itself becomes very important and a sacred space because the community gathers and a lot of things happen. Rituals happen there that, that are good, but uh, but that that put them in touch with God. But then but then there's these. Um, it's sometimes it, it can it can be. I was as Rabbi as you said, you know, the church can be or the space can be a. Walls where you don't, where they, the experience stays there. So, so trying to kind of to to, uh, to broaden that view is, uh, I mean, the nature, the beauty of nature is for sure the, the, the you know, uh, uh, what God's great gift give to us. So, uh, so I, I think it's another piece of integration. You know, what what does sacred space mean now that uh, you can do it virtually? Yes. And you know, what does it mean to uh, how, how how can we gather people? It, it, uh, integrate outdoor experiences or integrate other other ways of of, uh, of uh, building our traditions actually after this after the success of the high holidays outside so people said we're never going back inside <laughs> yeah, yeah. actually we had more people asking to donate to all the churches around in the synagogue which was a beautiful thing for all the faith communities <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, we had a holiday the week after and we knew we still couldn't go inside it's called simchat torah where we finish reading the five books of Moses and we basically have a party and dance around. We say, what can we do? So actually a member said, you know what, in our own neighborhood, and you, you, you do like seven, it's called Hakafot, seven circles around. So we found seven houses of our members 
and we took to the streets and we had about 250 people and we had a, a strolling band and there was music in the streets and yeah. people who are our members opened their doors and people who were not our members who were Jewish who were not Jewish opened their doors and what was that and they said oh wow this is really beautiful it's communal celebration um so um and now we're proactive. It used to be my meeting with Father Gil was reactive. Oh my gosh, we just faced this thing. Now what do I do? And now we're proactive in creating these experiences uh, inside and out. And actually last week in our, in the Bible, we read in the book of Exodus um, that you should make, you should make a sanctuary for yourself. And God says, I will dwell within them. And it's not that God doesn't need a sanctuary. We need a sanctuary. Um, and how do you create the spaces that we need in order to find God and the sports end. When I talk to all these sports people on the podcast, they say every week, the locker room is my sanctuary. If you were in that locker room, you completely understand the sacredness. Obviously a locker room in crypto.com arena is not, uh, St. Paul, the apostle in Sinai temple, but I found myself saying a lot this past two years, our Torah scrolls, which everybody loves to see. Um, I said, as much as we missed the Torah scrolls. I think as our sanctuary set empty, um, the scrolls in the rooms also missed us. And I think you really, really feel that now as people are coming back. Yeah, that, that's, that's really beautiful. Like, I was, uh, when I was in New York, I, I uh, worked with the New York Rangers a lot. Mm -hmm. So they invited me to the locker room. But the guys really opened up in the locker room. I was, I mean, these, you know, they're lifelong Catholics. And they, but that's where they would want to do <laughs> confession and, or, and just talk. I mean, it, it, I don't know, because it, 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 it is a sacred space for them. We, we struggled with that a bit. Uh, we tried to, um, the, the way we kind of invited people back in the church, we, we in that, then that big same space we have outside, we, uh, we got a big in and out burger truck. <laughs> you know, it came in, people just came and it was just, I mean, we invited people from the neighborhood and it was just, it was a really good experience. And you know, that was, that was the other part of, the, of, of this was that uh, we have all this grass in front of the church, as grassy areas. And throughout the pandemic, people were exercising, running their dogs. and. Mm -hmm just kind of in a park sort of way. It, it, that wasn't the case before, but people needed that uh, other space. So, so I know, I know a lot of my neighbors now, <laughs> just like, Hey, father, how are you doing? Can I do this? Can I, you know, can I come over? Sure. And, and you know, so, so we all, and so we've been, we've been doing uh, just kind of uh, trying to connect that we, we have, you know, uh, a vaccination drives with the LA County Department of Health and mainly for the neighborhood. I mean, people have been really just, I mean, it's been full the entire time blood drive and just trying to keep keep connected to uh, beyond our way beyond our walls so there was actually a, there was a man that heard our service because we put a pretty loud sound system there if you were in there i apologize for the uh, noise in the neighborhood but the uh a man who had just moved here from israel knew nobody heard the ancient melodies of uh yom kippur and yeah. came over and we it was for members only it was for just security purposes and our community welcomed them in and said like this is your home and now he's actually part of our synagogue community so actually going out brings you know people back in and something that sometimes they people don't even realize that they that they needed oh i should tell you we uh when when that was going on we went to listen we were yeah. standing in the little porch behind the uh, there's, there's a little porch behind the church and we just sat there and listened it was it was beautiful i i know it's for members only because i mean you had a lot how many people do you have out there there were <laughs> <laughs> And that evening, there were about 1,500, and oh again, that, that call was amazing, and we're yeah, looking forward to... Oh, it was amazing. It was. ...having those experiences, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, are there any other questions for the rabbi or father? John? Yeah. Uh, father uh, Gill, you think there'll be, uh, or the Catholic Church will be willing to allow more outdoor liturgies like we had during the height of the pandemic. And now we're pretty much back inside, but yeah. uh, that was such a great experience for many of us to go to uh, go to mass at the outdoor garden in the school there, you know? Yeah, like uh, that. yeah that's a really good question. Cause I, I mean, it, it, in our tradition, you, you have to be inside the church, literally. They, they really frown on outdoor services. Uh, you know, people want to get married on the beach or, and I, you know, but we, we try to make, uh, ensure that they're, they say connect to the community in, in the sacred space. Uh, but now that door's been open now in a way that, that previously has not been open. So uh, we, we, we are, because we have this really beautiful garden space, we are using it for, uh, for other services. Uh, I've had a couple of, I've had like two funerals since we've opened up, we've had two funerals out there. 
just because people preferred that and uh, uh, and, and and two and three weddings actually uh, the, the people wanted to to, to uh, it was a sacred space for them I, I think it was a sacred space for them I hope it was so, so but uh, and not and not just like a you know cool place to have a service or or, or you know something that was different it was there, there was there was some connection and I try to get them to articulate that or at least make the connection so officially the church will not we're 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 inside. That's it. But but if 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 you come and talk with us, we'll you know we'll we'll uh, you know we'll work it out. <laughs> so if, if if that's you know if, if that really is part of the kind of uh, kind of an experience we got for people, you know, I, um, I just don't want it to become a venue. That's not you know, that's really not what uh, what we're we're about. I, I just a venue. I mean, it is it is a venue, but it has some some sacred meaning to people. Are there any other questions? Uh, Mike Newman. Yeah. Years ago, when I was an altar boy at St. Paul's, um, I served mass, or I, I served a wedding ceremony, I should say, where, to my best of my recollection, it was the first time we had the Catholic priest and the Jewish rabbi on the altar in our church. And I forget what complications there were to make that the first. And where are we today if? Uh, there is a Jewish Catholic wedding, and how is that handled? Good question. Uh -oh. I can I can take it from my end first. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah so within Judaism, there's uh, three major denominations. Um, the so we're conservative. It doesn't mean politically conservative. It means conservative as tradition and change. Just want to put that uh, very squarely out there. We're very diverse in different political views. Um, within the um, marriage aspect, however, at this point, when I say at this point, um, conservative and orthodox um, will only officiate marriage between two uh, Jewish individuals. And it's more of a theological um, aspect because the blessings, like we are saying, are obligated, and we talked about the word obligated before, um, for two Jewish individuals. Um, there are definitely interfaith uh, partners and parents in our schools and, and things like that. But the actual right of there is, um, as of right now in the conservative and orthodox movements, um, we don't participate. However, I have wonderful reform colleagues that will, and we always make sure that we find the right match. So I'm not sure how it works in the Catholic church. So. Yeah, that's, um, on our end, it's, it's uh, we, we, uh, we, we celebrate those rights, but uh, it's, it's always with reformed because uh, in New York it was, I think there was only like one reformed rabbi <laughs> that would do it. And he was like in the Bronx. So, I mean, it was just, it was, it was hard to, to do that. Uh, but because of that, um, be, because the, the church wants to honor that, you, if a Catholic marries a, a Jewish person, then, uh, then that, that wedding does not have to occur inside of a church. Oh, it can it occur wherever, it, wh whatever is a respectable place where the two traditions can come together. And um, so, which is, which is really, and, and the, the right is completely different. We actually, usually what happens, uh, and I've done many, many Jewish Catholic weddings, but usually what happens, the, the, the rabbi will, will, will pretty much do the service. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do, I'll, after the main vows, then we'll do the Catholic vows. <laughs> and, but we always, and we, then, then we do the blessing of Aaron together. So um, yes. like I'll chant it in, 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 uh, in English and then uh, the rabbi will chant it in in uh, Hebrew. So, uh, yeah, so no, it, there's, uh, there's, there's a lot of, a lot of Jewish cats. Well, uh, I, I've had, to, I haven't had the experience here in LA. I've only been here four years, but in New York, I was there for 12 years, but there were just many of them. And, um, I, I, I have to say what one time was surprised that the, the, the family wanted to have it in our church in New York, which was, which was very unusual. I mean, that's, you know, but we did, it was the Jewish right pretty much. And, and, uh, but that that would be very unusual. I think usually it's 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 either outside or in a hotel or university club or something like that. So. What interesting you're saying where the weddings occur because uh, I've been at Sinai Temple since 2014 and I've only officiated one wedding within our synagogue walls. Um, everybody chooses different venues, so it's interesting to hear that actually the Catholic Church. I like that. I would love I would love for that uh, to bring that over that we should celebrate within our own walls. So uh, yeah. I don't want to put the hotels out of business, but it would be good to. Put the synagogues back in business. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Could I ask a question, Carol? Um, Carol, I think Carol was up. Oh, sorry, Carol, you raised your hand. Would you like to have a question? 
I did. Thank you, Tom, for acknowledging me. Uh, I'm Carol Rosenstein uh, here, a very happy and proud member of Westwood Rotary Club and so deeply touched by uh, this interfaith conversation today. Uh, I was born and raised in South Africa. I was just small enough to hold a Kiddush cup on a Saturday morning Shabbos service and sang in the shul choir for many, many years. Fast forward, I've just finished a very difficult 15 year journey with my darling husband suffering from Parkinson's and dementia. And um, it created a platform that is so happy. We're called Music Men's Minds. I'm in collaboration with Rotary International Clubs. Um, and I'm wondering whether we can create an organic seed at this very moment with everybody witness to this, that we have an interfaith musical group for our seniors at one or other of your locations so that we can serve seniors today suffering a pandemic of neurodegenerative diseases and we know how powerful music is bringing pure joy to these suffering souls, including increased brain function. And I hear Father Gilbert saying that they have a very strong music uh, group. Uh, I am sure Rabbi Sherman can echo the same sentiments. And I'd be deeply honored if I can co connect with the both of you to see whether we can do a combined music group to serve our seniors in great distress. So uh, I'd love to be able to talk with the both of you and see if we can do this as a collaboration. I see something beautiful on the horizon. God is watching. <sighs> Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Yeah, I, I would love to chat. We actually have a, a, a new, during the pandemic, a mental health center at Sinai Temple. And I think with that and our social action center, which is also uh, becoming more active as people realize the need to be with others and uh, care for others. So I would, uh, can, I can get your information from John maybe, and we can trade emails and maybe. I'll get the information. That, that, would, that, would, that, would be, that would be wonderful, I think. Uh, you know, I, I don't know that we know the total of the pandemic and we know, we know the numbers of people who died, but the, you know, we, 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 uh, here we had two young people committed suicide and it was, it was just dramatic. It was so, so difficult, but, and, and our own, our children too, they're, they're still struggling with trying to figure out what, uh, you know, what social skills are. I mean, they're, they're a little more rambunctious than they usually are and, and, and combative almost sometimes. And they're getting there, but it, it, you know, I think there was a result for that. And then the increased isolation for, uh, for seniors. I mean, there, many were already isolated, but it, it went on a hyperdrive. It just, it was, it was very, very difficult. You couldn't, could not visit. Uh, with them. So I think that this is a great idea, a wonderful idea. Thank you so much. And we can make it in, intergenerational because we do teach that when language skills fall away with these horrendous diseases with mm -hmm. no cure, that music becomes the language that keeps the families bonded till yeah. the end of the continuum. I saw this with my husband, no speaking, no walking, no anything except when in bed and I was hamming, singing, playing the, the, the dancing queen, up would come his arms and his <laughs> knees and legs. And he literally on his deathbed continued to dance with his wife. Mm. And for me, I've seen it all. The power of music is absolutely huge. It's all scientifically corroborated. Yeah. And the world needs music right now. So let's go for an interfaith music group, Music Men's Minds, together with Rotary International Clubs. Peter, I think you had a question. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, I had a question for uh, Father Gill and Rabbi Sherman. You know, we've seen these mega churches that are so successful, huge turnouts. They're, they seem to be financially successful. I'm just wondering, um, could the Jewish religion or the Catholic church use some of their techniques or, or would it not really apply? Like I'm talking about, you know, people like Joel Osteen and Rick Warren, do any of the things that they're doing, would that work in the Jewish faith or the Catholic faith? Father, you wanna go first? 
Uh, <laughs> I'm sure you hear what you say. I have my thoughts too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I will. You know, so, um, with 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 mega churches, it depends uh, greatly on on kind of their orientation. But a lot of them uh, have uh, amazing outreach programs, uh, and uh, I mean, some of them are like like those old malls. You can go to places, and there's there's a coffee shop, and there's this, there's everything is there, so you can just do everything there, and it kind of it takes up people's lives. Uh, but but uh. You know, for for us, um, theologically, our our we're, we're our community is focused around the Eucharist and gathering people around that. So we 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 do use some of some of some of their uh, practices for sure. Uh, but but we're also we're also intent about uh, uh, about gathering around for us gathering around the Eucharist and, and being sent forth. The the, uh, the other thing is that the. The Catholic Church is so is, I mean, it, it uh, the, the parishes are very very important. So people have a, a local sacred home. So they they they're not they they don't even we, we do have large events at the cathedral downtown, but I mean that only holds like three thousand people, and that would that would be an event. There there's a big event for Our Lady of Guadalupe, and uh, that you know, that'll be a, you know forty or fifty thousand people, but. But those would be those are the exceptions that when they, when they try to gather as many people from the community. But but we're we're more congregational. I never thought I would say this about the Catholic Church, but we're much more congregational than, and 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 um, and and, uh, and being able to gather around the Eucharist. It's it partly is very practical I mean, you, to to be able to for everyone to receive and, and to drink is, uh, is 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 really important. Plus, also I I don't know how to say this delicately, but I I. I a lot of the some of those congregations are have really been tied up in, with political parties in, in a way that hasn't necessarily been healthy. I think, and and uh, you know, we try to we. It's not that we don't take stand and work on different issues, and that we do have a rich uh, social teaching, social justice teaching, but uh, but it's um, but to but to to get in bed with political with political parties, I think is kind of defeats our our, our purpose. Yes, I'll work backwards. So with the political piece, uh, you know, I'll quote my senior rabbi, he once said, uh, we don't come to talk about Pence and Pelosi, we come to talk about Moses and Joshua. Um, yes. If Moses and Joshua informs you about that, that's wonderful, but that's up to you, not to me. Um, so that's important. Um, the, I am obviously of the sort of, uh, I have one more year in the millennial world, I'm 39 right now. Um, but uh, social media and media, I think are important in the religion business, if you wish, right now. Um, I know for a fact that people do watch us from afar. So a little different than the Jewish community and the Catholic community when there's less of us. Uh, so the person sitting in Iowa who doesn't have a synagogue uh, actually feels congregational to Sinai Temple in Los Angeles mm -hmm. because they've heard of it before. Um, I know it's a little different in the Catholic and how the, the hierarchical structure works. Um, what I do like about the mega church is their use of media, um, not for the political piece, but actually for the spiritual piece. Um, like I said before, I get some great, you know, sermon sound bites from some of the great pastors. Um, we, so uh, there, there are two Jewish TV stations. Um, one of them actually just picked up the podcast that I'm doing because they want to do a little more mo modernity. That, that TV station is called JBS. It's in local on Spectrum here in DirecTV. Um, Jewish Broadcasting Service is 24 hours of Jewish content. And on the weekends, they have two services, one from Central Synagogue in New York and one from uh, an Orthodox synagogue that's pre-recorded. What they don't have is a West Coast presence or a, or a, a conservative synagogue. Uh, we went on there for the high holidays a couple of years ago and we, when people were shut in and people watched and they viewed and they actually felt connected. That led to people now watching Rabbi Wolpe teach his Bible class every Thursday morning and my podcast and my wife's conversation with this person, that person. Um, so I think some of it, if it's used correctly, um, but I do think that I love watching Midnight Mass from St. Patrick's Cathedral on Fifth Avenue. I love, I just find that majestic. I've been watching that since I'm a kid <laughs> um, and seeing into the Catholic churches that way that I wouldn't necessarily be able to, you know, just enter on a regular day. So I like to say the best of both worlds, but I think it's a fine line in how it's how it's used, not for entertainment, but for um, religious education and knowledge. Yeah. Rabbi, we thank you so much, Father Gill. We thank you so much for being here. 
what an enlightening conversation we had today. We uh, thoroughly enjoy it. And both of your honors, we are gonna make a contribution to the Westwood Village Library in your names. Uh, yeah. With that, I'm gonna draw the meeting to a close. It's 1.30, so some people can get back to work. <laughs> and uh, so we thank you so much. It was just terrific. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you Father. Thank you. That, we'll bring the meeting to a close, everybody. Have a good day. Thank you.